You are good to go. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about the uh, microscopic evaluation of wastewater and, and somewhat troubleshooting the process upsets. Um, every time I talk about this, I'd like to take a little trip down memory lane is that the, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, analytical methods of, of analyzing a biological treatment process. We look at dissolved oxygen, we look at temperature, we can measure biomass, we can measure the volatility of that biomass in a series of tests. Um, we can measure, measure settling in the amount of time. And it all gives us an indication of how well our process is proceeding. And, uh, but the microscopic examination has been something that's been around uh, and, and developed um, probably in the late 60s and early 70s when I kind of got into this is where it really took off into wastewater treatment. I've been around for a while, so that's why I like to take a little trip down memory lane at times. But uh, the microscopic uh, tool in, in the 70s was something that was extremely valuable and used almost on a daily basis in uh, biological wastewater treatment plants. And what has happened over the years is that skill has uh, not really been passed on to the next generation of wastewater operators. Uh, the microscope is still in the laboratory. They were generally part of the, uh, the uh, United States government when they were funding the building of wastewater treatment plants and, and staffing and even providing uh, assistance for staffing them in the uh, 70s, uh, late 70s and early 80s. And a microscope was always part of it. At least where I come from in New York, uh, we had a series of trainers who taught us how to use the microscope. And then, uh, of course, uh, um, some of the gurus came around. But if we look at what we can do with a microscope in, the, in a biological treatment process, it, um, uh, all plants should have a microscope, uh, both municipal and industrial plants. You'll find them in most municipal plants. Like I said, they were always specified as essential equipment back in the 70s when a lot of these plants were upgraded to secondary treatment systems. Phase contrast microscope is usually the best for reviewing the biomass, but not necessary. And then um, as far as the frequency, like the other tests you perform in wastewater treatment, um, generally anytime you, you see a, a change or something, sort of sludge age or any variability on your feet or something, in other words, something that's gonna affect that environment in which the biology lives in. And of course, the operators should be able to do this. Um, again, like I said, a lot of them have lost the skill over the years or it wasn't transferred down to that generation. And as we get towards the end of this presentation, I'll talk to you about a uh, about something that we've developed internally here with Ramble that might be able to solve some of that problem. And there's your microscope. There's nothing uh, difficult to understand about if you've ever seen one. Um, I don't know if anybody can see the, uh, the pointer, but uh, you know, we have an attachment for a camera. That's one of the advantages too that's occurred over the years is that uh, the ability to have digital image capture, um, that's been a big improvement, but the microscope itself has remained the same. And uh, before in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, we had 35 millimeter uh, pictures we used to have to take and send them out to get developed and then, and then uh, use them for our, for our files. Now dim, uh, digital image analysis makes everything fairly easy. And of course, uh, there's been several publications of what we call the Bible in uh, looking at the biomass of, of wastewater treatment plant. And, and these are sort of like the gurus who have uh, uh, brought us all up on understanding what to look at under a microscope and how to interpret what we see. So you got David Jenkins from California and of course his graduate student, Michael Richard, who became the guru of uh, microscopy and, and only retired a couple of years ago. And, and then of course, Glenn Dager, and, and they're at the point now where they're starting to name some of the organisms after these people, which is quite an honor uh, seeing that they're all still alive. So the goal of a microscopic evaluation is we like to look at the change in population of, of key indicator organisms, uh, higher life forms, change in flock structure. Uh, the abundance of filaments is very important, especially when we rely on gravity for solid separation in a, in a biological treatment plant. And of course, we can also see other things that are in the, uh, in the, in the mass at times. We can see powdered carbon. We could see other uh, pieces of, of material, uh, inert material, organic, inorganic. And of course, we can also detect the presence of polysaccharides, which becomes very important. Microscopic uh, evaluation, uh, like I said, um, the, the microscopes are usually around um, 100, res 100 resolution, gives you a good overview of the flock structure. 400 times allows you to look at some key indicator organisms. 
And of course, a 1000x can be used to observe individual bacteria, but not necessarily uh, required for day to day. The thing is, is these objective lenses are what becomes part of the, uh, the expense of a, mi a microscope is the optics. Again, how frequently uh, should we do this? Well, um, it's kind of dictated by the circumstances. Uh, you know, if you're just starting up a, uh, a, a treatment plant, certainly looking at the microscope daily at the biomass development is important. If you have settling problems or when bulking occurs, and if you have to challenge that uh, bulking with uh, uh, one of the methods we can use is chlorinating uh, the return activated sludge to control these filaments when they get out of control, you're gonna wanna look at the effect of that RAS chlorinating. So you're gonna wanna do that daily. For the routine characterization, maybe once every uh, cell resident time, uh, depending on where your facility is located. Sometimes seasonally is important. Um, uh, in Northeast here, we get seasonal changes in temperature. Uh, we start seeing different performance of kinetics, um, setability, um, good to watch the biomass under those conditions. And then of course, the uh, if you end up with problems and the severity of that problem, you, you wanna establish an operating history and if you have the budget available to send these pictures out uh, or the images, uh, the samples out for images, um, you can do that or you can learn how to do it yourself. So here's a sort of like a schedule of what I recommend. Um, start up daily, bulking daily, any RAS chlorination daily. For routine, SRT, maybe monthly or seasonally. And of course, anytime you do any experimental operations, uh, cycling on and off times to create anoxic environments or something like that, you may want to look at the biomass or weekly. And of course, these are some of the uh, pictures that have been in the textbooks for years. As you uh, increase your cell resonance time, uh, you get a different relative predominance of certain organisms. Um, and they all represent the ability to settle and separate solids from liquids in your final settling tanks. So you can see that early um, residence times, you, you don't see quite as well-developed flock as you do just when you get out there about maybe five to seven days. And then of course, the longer it goes, you start breaking down again. Another illustration of this is looking at it. Uh, this is what we see under the microscope under those same conditions. And here's a little graphic representation. As you see a high food to mass ratio, what you have is you have your bacteria rapidly growing. They're um, not forming filaments, which are required to form a flock structure. Uh, so they're kind of dispersed growth. And uh, what you do is you don't really get that well of a well-formed flock. So your settling can be uh, uh, poor at that time. And as time goes on, you develop a different population of bacteria. You see some stalk ciliates, some free swimming ciliates. You start seeing good flock formation, polysaccharide formation, which allows the bacteria to adhere to each other, and you get a good settling flock. And of course, as you get longer sludge ages, that starts breaking down again. And here's a couple of pictures of what they might look like. As you can see here, um, we see some higher life forms right here. We see some flock structures to see the development of filaments. And these filaments are important because they're required for this inner flock bridging, which gives you a nice dense flock and allows it to drop through the water column, bringing along with it solids. So your effluent is clear and free of solids. It's another stalked higher life forms. We see that as the sludge ages. You see the, fil uh, the stalk off of that. Don't get that confused with a filament. And here's a really well-formed flock. As you can see, it's got a nice structure to it. It's rather round. It's a good size. Um, it has good inner flock bridging with the filaments. And if you look into space in between the filaments and the flock, you don't really see a lot of, of free particles around there. It looks pretty clear. So that'll settle well in a clarifier and give you a nice clear effluent. Here's a dispersed flock. As you can see, we don't see much inner flock bridging here. We do see some higher life forms. But what we see is we see pieces of filaments. This particular biomass is under stress. Now this will settle, but this obviously will not settle that well, these particles here. So you'll pick them up in the effluent. 
Here's some filaments starting to form. Again, decent looking flock structure. You can see by looking at the shape here, you can see that these may be different types of filaments. We can tell what these filaments might be by identifying their shape, their size, and we know what conditions they grow in, all from the, uh, the guru's literature. So here's filaments starting to proliferate a little more. Again, we see a nice well-formed flock. You see some inner flock bridging. And we also see in this space in between the, the flock particles and the filament here, we also see a very clear liquid, which is gonna give us a nice clean effluent. This picture here, this micrograph, we start seeing a proliferation of uh, filaments. They're excessive. As a matter of fact, they're at a point right now where they're going to start uh, inhibiting settling. And this becomes a problem. Here's another picture. This is even at 100x, which is one of the lowest magnifications. You can see some decent higher life forms. You see some flocks extending from the, uh, or filaments extending from the flock. And over in here, you see some inner flock bridging all indicative of a, of a good flock formation. Here again, we see a flock structure that's kind of not well formed. We don't see many filaments at all. And we don't see much inner flock bridging. We might see a bridge here. We see a, a rather spread out, dispersed looking flock. But what we notice here is look at all the stuff in between in the clear liquid here. Obviously, as that settles, it's not going to settle well, number one. Number two, it's going to leave behind some, some material that we really want to capture. One of the other things we can do with the, uh, with the microscope, uh, by any ink staining, we can use to determine if excessive polysaccharides are present. And uh, when polysaccharides are being secreted by a, a, a biomass, uh, they're being secreted because they're under stress of some form. Usually it's a nutrient deficiency, could be a toxic loading, could be an inf insufficient food supply to support the biomass. So under low food to mass conditions, what happens is the bacteria start hoarding um, polysaccharides as a form of food. And then when they're under stress, they start to protect themselves by secreting polysaccharides. So how can we tell that we're under stress? Well, what we do is we do what's called any ink stain. Take a simple drop of the mixed liquor. We mix it with India ink and we look at it quickly under the microscope. And as you can see here, where, this, where the stain doesn't penetrate the biomass, where these arrows are pointing, these clear spaces, is indicating that the biomass is starting to secrete a polysaccharide protecting itself. Here's another picture of an India ink stain. This is a little bit different. You can see some of the penetration going on here, but you can still see the early formations of polysaccharides, indicating that the biomass could be under stress, whether it's low nutrients, whether it's low or high food to mass, there's a stress causing the bacteria to try to protect itself. So how do we treat these uh, polysaccharides when they start forming? Because they're not going to settle well and they're going to cause problems. Well, we look at the loading rate. Is it high or low? Can we correct that? Do we have environmental problems that cause the stress on the biomass? Are, are we seeing uh, periods of low uh, dissolved oxygen? Uh, we, we, are, we are fighting a mess right now at a, at a particular facility that uh, experienced a loss of DO because of a power outage. Uh, power failed for several hours inability to turn on the blowers. We have low DO. Once we come back up, the bacteria are responding to it by secreting uh, polysaccharides right now. It's somewhat problematic. High organic acids, I've seen that in the past, seen that numerous times. That'll cause problems. Um, generally, pump stations that contribute to the wastewater treatment plant, um, you know, if they turn on once or twice a day, they can get pretty ripe in there, create a lot of volatile fatty acids, and uh, that can cause some problems. And, and you don't see it too often in municipal facilities um, with the deficiencies in nutrients, whether it's uh, nitrogen or, but in industrial facilities, this is a common problem, whether you're treating leachate, 
um, we're almost always deficient in phosphorus. And uh, if you're treating um, like paper waste, you're almost always deficient in, in nitrogen. But the uh, takeaway message is, is that the uh, nutrient deficiencies occur more frequently in industrial uh, treatment settings than they do in municipal settings. And sometimes the addition of ferric chloride can reduce the effects of polysaccharides. But then again, um, you're intervening. The other thing that we can do under a microscope is that if your plant is required to uh, perform biological phosphorus removal, um, we try to create an environment where we have uh, phosphate accumulating organisms versus the glucose accumulating organisms and uh, or the GAOs. Um, but the phosphate accumulating organisms, they do store phosphorus and that's what we're trying to do. And then the GAOs or the glucose accumulating organisms, uh, they don't store phosphorus. And it's a sign of a BioP breakdown. And this shows up pretty well under a microscope. This is stained with either pseudon black or methylene blue, very simple stain, quick stain. And these dark spots here, get my pointer, as you can see, are indicating that we have a good concentration of phosphate accumulating organisms in this particular sample. Actually, it's very good. Better picture, a little focus. You can see them all picked up the stain. They're all here. This is the biomass in the background. So under these conditions, the microscope was able to tell us that we are uh, doing well with our environment to create a BioP efficiency. Um, when you see tetrads, these are what we call the GAOs I just mentioned. Um, they do not store phosphorus. And if you see these under the microscope, you can expect trouble real soon. And they look like uh, somewhat like a, a baseball here. Very easy to spot when stained, and that's a simple stain. Again, this one's a methylene blue stain. And here's an unstained version. And you can see these right here, we call them tetrads under this condition here. And they look like little Rubik's cubes. And when you see these, you're gonna have two real big problems. Number one, this doesn't settle well at all. So you're gonna have really big problems with settling. And number two, um, if you rely on phosphorus accumulation or BioP, um, that's indicating that it's it's not happening. The competition is switched over to the uh, to the GAOs, and and you're starting to see tetrads. So you can spot that under a microscope as well. We can look for nitrifiers. We have a system that we're required to nitrify as part of our uh, nutrient removal. We can spot these nitrifiers in the magnification here of a biomass. And they appear like these little bunches of grapes along the outside of the, the biomass here. You have to look real close. You have to know what you're looking for. Now, filamentous bacteria. Um, obviously, like I said, that you require some filamentous bacteria because you need a stable flock structure structure you need that uh that inner flock structure but excessive filamentous bacteria or overabundance of filamentous bacteria can cause some real problems and i'm talking about big time problems whether it's poor settling or foaming <clears throat> and we're also experiencing foaming issues right now at the facility um when you see this type of of, of stress under the uh, microscope, it's an indicative that there's something going on in the system that has to be corrected. And of course, the filament problems are detected in the secondary clarifier, right? Because you're not going to settle, but they're controlled in the aeration tank. And here's a here's a, uh, a picture of a foaming bioreactor, it's SBR here. Not too bad. Some foam uh, is tolerable. Here's some bad foam. This is thick, dense. The problem when you get foam on these reactors is the foam can act as an insulation as well. Not only does it not settle well, but it can act as an insulation. 
So now what happens is you start generating heat from the uh, bacterial metabolism of COD in there. The heat is trapped inside of the reactor. You start elevating the temperatures and now you start breaking down your flock formation. You can uh, create an environment where the GAOs um, uh, will outcompete for the PAOs. And you have filaments that kind of like to live in that environment. So uh, if, 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 it's, if it's nice and, and happy for them to live in that environment, they'll multiply and they'll do well and they'll, they'll cause you a whole round of trouble. And foam can even get worse than this. It can exit the, exit the tank. Here's a picture of it here. And, and, and not only is this foam right here, but if you look close at the picture, you'll see this is all foam. This whole area is foamed. This is a major uh, um, foam over. As you can imagine, it could result in regulatory uh, problems. Certainly, it's not very safe. Um, some of these foams are, are known human path, pathogens. Um, actually, nocardia is a known pathogen. In this, in this case, this was a nocardia foam. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go down through the slides here. Here's another foaming incident. Uh, this occurred at a uh, at a sweet drink producing uh, juice producing facility. Um, again, high food to mass. Um, this stuff was bad uh, in this case. I remember it very well. Uh, when the winds came, it blew it out of the tank and into people's yards um, a couple thousand feet down the down the road. It was a real bad mess. Again, we can look at this. We see some filamentous bacteria here on the right. As you can see the filaments forming. And then we see non-filamentous bacteria. You can imagine now from what we've talked about so far and what we've seen, that the one on the left is not going to settle very well. The one on the right, um, it's going to settle. It's starting to get to the point where you may have a little bit too much bridging. And also these look like they could be problematic filaments at first inspection. So how do I identify a filamentous bacteria? Well, we know that they bloom under different conditions. So if we can identify the filament, we can identify the condition that caused them. And if we can correct the condition, we can correct the, uh, the problems caused by that filament. So we have to fix it. Some of the uh, filaments that are um, problematic, at least in a lot of municipal facilities and industrial facilities, nocardia is always a problem. Nocardia is like a bad infectious disease. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Uh, you almost have to deal with it once it comes. It's present with low DO, high oils, fats, and greases. And then your type O21N is present usually in nutrient deficiency. You'll see it in both nitrogen and phosphorus deficient uh, treatment systems, which means they're probably a, a, in a, an industrial facility, although you'll see type O21N in municipal facilities from time to time, generally because what's happening in the uh, collection system, industrial treatment, a lot of times we'll see this when we have uh, uh, like a, a, a brewery or something like that that's tying into the system. All of a sudden you see this high surge of COD coming down to the treatment plant and it wasn't normally seen. And that surge comes down without a nutrient balance. So you can see that imbalance and then you can see the, the proliferation of the type O21N. And that can be problematic when you're relying on gravity for uh, solid separation, settling tanks. So here's what we know from the literature and from our experience that under low DO concentrations, we can see the filament types known as an S-natin, a type 1701 or the H-hydrosis. If we have low food to mass concentrations, what we can see is we can see the type 041, uh, 0041, 0675, 1851's common. And these are your slime formers. These are the ones that get real sticky and, and nasty. If you have a low molecular weight organic acids contributing to the influent or to the mix, uh, you'll see your type O21N as well as your theothric species. Your limnicola, which we're seeing right now is a major uh, form, uh, foam former. Um, hydrogen sulfide, remember I talked about those um, pump stations that may sit for a while before they discharge. Again, Begiatoa species, your theothrix, type O21N. <clears throat> and then of course your Nitrogen and phosphorus, your macronutrient deficient uh, wastewaters will tend to flourish. The, uh, the type and the hydrosis, natans, and these are your, your slime formers. What you don't see too much of is you don't see any uh, fungi in the, uh, in the biomass, and that usually only occurs when you have some prolonged times of, of low pH. And by low pH, I mean uh, four, five, five. 
when you're operating down there, you got a whole bunch of other problems in your regular biomass. So it, that doesn't happen too often. So pay attention to a little bit of the uh, the highlighted area here under the characteristics. So the S natans, you'll see that they're round ended rod, they're sausage shaped. Um, now when you stain them, uh, they're gram negative. And we know what they cause by low DO. Uh, the H hydrosis, they look like pins in a cushion. Um, formed under low DO, low food to mass. Your theothrix one and two, uh, both show up at the same time. Uh, they're barrel shaped. The only difference is one's thicker than the other. That's the difference between one and two. Your type O21N are your, are your hockey pucks, your stacked hockey pucks. And this is the way I, uh, I uh, learned them over the years. And, and when I tell everybody what to look for, um, they kind of get it real fast. Your limnicola. Looks like a string of pearls, low food to mass. You type 1851, uh, they have a sheath on them uh, and uh, they're rectangular shaped. And Begiatoa species, uh, they're actually motile, uh, you know, motile in the uh, wastewater. You can see them move a little bit. And then of course, you know, Cardia species, they're branched. Uh, the, and the early stage looked like rabbit droppings. A lot of people won't pick them up. Uh, but now that I mentioned what they look like, you might see them if you look under the microscope. So here's an S Natans. If you look close, focus on it, you can see the sausages there, right? Here's the type O21N. Again, you look close, you can see them separated here. Looks like some hockey pucks stacked up on each other. Here's a real mess right here of O21N an overabundance of filaments. This will not settle at all. This stuff will float. Here's your Begiatoa species. As you can see them here, they got these bright spots in them. Here's your S. Natans. Here's your pin cushions coming out of the flock, a bunch of pins. But if you look closely in here, what you'll see is you'll see several uh, species of, of uh, filaments. You see this thick one here. Kind of a Theothrix looking. This one here, and you see this. You see the spikes coming out a bit. And remember, I talked about the Limnicola, uh, the string of pearls. Don't you see it? Kind of says, oh, yeah, that's exactly what they are. Here's your Nocardia. These are your bad actors. Um, Sometimes these are worthy of uh, calling it a career if they show up at your plant. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, they look like branches, sticks on the ground. Here's a picture of them starting to proliferate, getting pretty rough. And then here's some Nocardia buds. Remember I said if you look closely, this is even a poorly focused uh, image I have here. And uh, it, it's, it's, I took the image, so I'm, I'm at fault here. But uh, if you look, these look like uh, rabbit droppings. And those are precursors. Those won't cause a problem in the wastewater plant, uh, but they continue to be in the environment with the high oil and grease. Um, those are going to turn into full fledged adult nocardia sooner than you think. And then you're going to end up with those foaming problems I showed you pictures of earlier. So if we have too much food and not enough microorganisms, the settling problems are observed as the bacteria are constantly multiplying. They're not forming a flock. So they become buoyant. They don't settle or separate very well at all. They're dispersed. This is a zooglia. This is when you have really high food to mass. If you can see this here, is you don't have a really good flock structure at all. What happens in this case, these are very buoyant. They actually float. So you don't get settling at all. Where do we find the uh, zooglia problems? Usually they're quite common in these food and beverage facilities all the time. It, it's, it's, you can almost come on and, and see solids that don't settle and we say, let's put it under the microscope because we're gonna see zooglia. In municipal facilities, uh, it can be a significant problem, again, with industrial discharges. Your breweries, um, we see it when uh, airport de-icing fluids are discharged. To a municipal facility and it's not controlled. 
you know, that uh, glycol is is bug candy, and uh, that stuff is is metabolized, and and it, you end up with that zooglia, and you get poor settling problems. They'll float right through the system. If you have too little food and not enough microorganisms, the bacteria will lose their flagella. Uh, they no longer multiply, but they form a slime or polysaccharide. So they try to protect themselves, they try to save food for another day. So how do we control these filaments? Well, we, if we can identify the type, we can correct the causes. We can correct low nutrients by supplements. If we have a toxic substance coming in there, we can find out what it is and eliminate it from the system. We can control the filamentous growth, and sometimes uh, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, control foaming with uh, hypochlorite or an antifoam, um, other chemicals that work for some of the filaments, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, um, and, and, and if it's really if it's really bad, uh, a selector may have to be designed into the facility to handle the, uh, or at least to suppress the uh, development of problematic filaments. Here's the type O21N. Again, from my description, you can see the stack hockey pucks. And then this is an unusual case here because um, this type uh, O21N is actually chlorine resistant. And we found this out several years ago when we were treating o uh, O21N breakout at that that uh, sweet um, juice beverage facility. Uh, we were trying to break them up with uh, chlorine, and we found out that they weren't touched. They looked they looked strong and healthy under the microscope, and uh, we found out that there was some uh, appearance uh, and generally identified as a uh, chlorine resistant type O21N. So they almost, you know, like a lot of bacteria that cause infections, these things can sometimes develop resistance to uh, or protect themselves from the things that we use to control them. Type of foam, young sludge, recovering from an upset. Again, it's that white, thin, frothy, you know, transient. In other words, as soon as the air is taken away from it, it tends to break. If you have filamentous type of foam, it's a heavier, more stable. It's got that greasy, slick appearance. Uh, oil and grease are almost always part of the mix in there, it's cause. And if you have that uh, stress biomass, you'll see that as well. You get that heavy gel-like and polysaccharide formation. There are times where this is in such high concentrations, like I think Mark Green and I saw it out at, uh, at uh, uh, again, an, another uh, sweet and, and chocolatey, uh, preparation facility that packaged things for the McDonald's Corporation. And uh, this, this was so thick with polysaccharides, you were able to stick an actual uh, spoon in it and, and pull out a big, you know, like a big slime drag off of it. Foam control, um, try to create that stable environment in the aeration tank. Uh, sometimes that's scum in the center. Like I said, one thing about uh, Nocardia, it's like an infectious disease. If it's sticking on the side of the tank, once you control it, it can reinfect the basin. Um, you can use uh, defoamers like our uh, oil-based, silica-based, and zinc-based defoamers. Some defoamers work better than others. Always good to test them. And then uh, when defoamer does work well, sometimes it's, it's good to uh, um, retrofit the facility. Either you can put a foam trap in there, or or we uh, we've just retrofitted a facility with some spray nozzles to uh, dispense the foam because the foam is best works best when it's directly applied to the foam. Now a lot of uh, filament will not respond well at all the foam uh, anti foam chemicals, and this usually happens when you have the long. Uh, the older sludges, because what's happened is you end up with a lot of skeletal remains from old bacteria. They actually form a pretty, pretty intense structure there. So uh, between that and, uh, and and the stickiness of it, it, it forms a very good hard crust of of a. Uh, and everybody's seen this, who's in the business, uh, on on the um, as as form of their foam. Sometimes a combination of bleach and defoamer can be beneficial. So. Uh, when I was talking to somebody about this oh, a few months ago, somebody says, why do we have to worry about filaments when, you, when we are utilizing membranes now for solid separation, especially in our landfill leachate treatment facilities, some of our industrial facilities? And of course, here's a, a recent publication where it's the correlation of the epipolysaccharide content and activated sludge in different SRTs 
um, with membrane following phenomenon. And what's happening is that these, these um, polysaccharides uh, can cause membrane following where you get slow runs on your membrane. Uh, they're difficult to clean. They become expensive to clean. They're time consuming. They require chemical. So the, uh, the EPS or the, the slime, the polysaccharide, if it's secreted, can cause problems with membrane. It uh, could cause some major problems with membranes. And like I said before, if, if you're not familiar with how to uh, analyze and look for a uh, various filaments and bacteria under the microscope, um, in 2018, uh, Brian Arndt and myself were, were the uh, uh, awarded uh, money to develop what we called OPSIZE, which is artificial intelligence for examining uh, wastewater uh, microscopically. And it makes your life a lot easier uh, and as opposed to taking that sample and putting it in a mailer and sending it back to Syracuse or to Pennsylvania or to uh, Nashville to have one of our microscopists to look at it. If you can get a good picture with your microscope, uh, and we have a, an adapter on a phone to allow you to do that. You can upload it and you can have results in a matter of uh, minutes. And if you would like to get a free sample, I would encourage you to reach out to Brian or myself. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to get the word out that this is out. We've had some, uh, some of our clients use it right now. It's uh, been amazingly accurate. Um, it's exceeding my expectations. And uh, it's been working out very well. And everybody who's used it so far have, have been very uh, impressed with it. So uh, I'm glad it's at where it's at right now. Again, you just take a sample of your activated sludge, take a photo of it. You can use your phone. We have an adapter, as you can see up here. We have an adapter we can provide you with if you have that microscope from the 70s and 80s sitting around in your lab. You take that photo, you upload the photo, we analyze it and you get a detailed uh, report of what filaments are in there and what to do to correct the environment which caused that filaments. Again, that's uh, opsize.com. I encourage you to check it out. And with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention during this uh, Lunch and Learn. And I think we left here now for uh, questions, uh, hopefully, if anybody has any questions. Frank, Zach put one in the chat window for you. Um, can you read it? Because I, I don't see the chat window when I got the. Uh... Yes. All right. What is the biological cause or activity that creates high F to M foam, white billowing? Is this caused by increased production of biopolymer or a respiration phenomenon? Well, it's it's the production of the ethyl polysaccharide. It's the polysaccharide secretion, the excess of polysaccharide secretion. The bacterial mass is now secreting more polysaccharide. It's required to form a flock. Um, they try to. Uh, it's almost it's almost the analogy of biop, where the where the where the biomass takes up additional phosphorus because it thinks it's going to need it later based on the environment it's in. When it's in this environment, um, uh, the Bacteria thinks now that under low food to mass that it may not get any food for a while. So it takes it internally uh, as a form of polysaccharide. So as you start getting mixes like that, then you start applying air to the sticky polysaccharide with sticky bacteria in it and you get bubbly, uh, milkshake looking foam. Any other questions? Hey, Frank, this is Jason. Yes. Hey, for like uh, MBBR media, um, you know, I imagine that would present some difficulties for looking under a microscope. Um, I guess, can you talk about that at all? I mean, are you only looking at it at like a very low level magnification, really just to see if there's, you know, film on there or do you scrape any off and try to then go to, you know, oil immersion or is that just ridiculous? Well, well that, that's a good question, uh, Jason, because, uh, you know, when we're, when we're using a, a, a a fixed media to support the biological growth, whether it's a trickling filter or, or the, like Jason said, the moving bed bioreactor. What becomes important is the, the growth of the bacteria on the media. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can pull it off and you can, you can do a, um, a slide mount and look at it in a microscope, give you an idea of, of what you have in there and, and uh, what it's capable of, of doing. 
but uh, those t tend not to be that much of a problem, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, trickling filters, um, you know, they slough their, their, their solids off and, and you rely on that to settle or separate it with a membrane. And uh, in the MBBR, um, you have the, the sloughing take place, uh, you know, as a normal phase of growth on the uh, carrier media. Thanks. I don't know if that answered your question completely, but. Anything else? Frank, this is probably a small question, but to do the. Uh, I don't think I'd ever seen that you could identify nitrifying bacteria. Did you say that had to be stained to see nitrifying bacteria or was that under just a straight up? On, no, that, on, that's, on uh, that's probably a, a minimum 400x magnification. You can see them. Huh. And that's just the, kind of the, the bumpy edges on the outside of the flock. Those are those little bunches of grapes uh, that you would see on the outside. The outside. They're always attached. Uh, nitrifiers are always attached to the flock. They don't exist as a separate mass. Hey, Frank, this is Ed Frime. <clears throat> Any idea how, what magnification you need to see in Ocardia? Is it like a very high oh, magnification? No, yeah, no, no Cardia Ephraim is, is real easy to see. You can, you can see that at 100x, uh, certainly at 400x, it, it, it really sticks out. But no Cardia is one of the uh, easier um, filaments to identify. It, it is really a, an easy filament to identify. Some of the ones that are a little difficult to identify is the ones that, that look a little bit like each other. Um, like the Theo, like I said, Theothrix one and two, um, does it make any difference? Because they both show up in the, uh, they have a genetic you know, difference, but they both show up under the same condition. One's a little bit fatter than the other. Theothrix one's a little fatter than Theothrix two. Thanks. No, car no Cardi is very uh, recognizable. And again, like I said, with nocardia, nocardia is almost like a like an infectious disease. If, if you know, nocardia will stick to everything. So if it's it's on the sidewalls of a aeration basin, and you and you you cleaned it out pretty good, and you 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 washed it out with with a wasting, um, if you have some of that dried on the side, and and that falls off into the uh, the aeration basin, it's it's just going to reinfect itself and. If, if the conditions are right, it's just going to flourish again. It's really difficult to get rid of. Yeah. And and Frank, uh, for test relative to EPS, is that something that you're looking to correlate um, measurements with, you know, slides with with uh, well, the slide photographs? Gets, that's a good question, Frank, because the slide gives you a good indication that that polysaccharides are being secreted, and and um, because you don't see the penetration of the ink stain into the biomass, the anthrone test is an analytical test, and what that tells is the percentage of polysaccharides per unit mass of mixed liquor, and uh, based on that, it's more of a quantitative test than it is just a presence absence type type of test that you get with the uh, with the ink stain. Takes a little more time, gives you a little bit more information. Right. And when it comes to membranes, the literature tells us that if the polysaccharide is greater than 20 to 22%, you're gonna have problems. So it might be a good test to, to monitor on occasion. When you So let's say your microscopic exam shows that I'm secreting polysaccharides because I don't get good ink penetration. Maybe now I send it for an anthrone test and I have the anthrone test confirm where my polysaccharides are. If they're around 18, 19 uh, percent, um, I can soon expect problems with my membrane system. So will upsize op might be a recommendation to, based on the slide, to say, go do anthrum testing to, you know, further quantify where you are. But, if it's yeah, right now, upsize is capable of identifying the most frequent filamentous bacteria. It's able to discriminate the relative frequency of them. And the other modules we are working on right now will be, and this should be fairly easy, but we just need a few more images to make sure we have the confidence in the test, will be the uh, India ink penetration. And then as we as we move down with time, uh, we might be able to get full uh, uh, evaluation of a, of a microscope's uh, uh, 
microscopic analysis. In other words, we might be able to, uh, if you remember that slide I had up about the re relative predominance of various stalk ciliates and, and everything to give an age of the, of the, of the biomass, we, we might be able to do that. That's going to take a little time, but right now it's very, very accurate at identifying the filaments. You know, and to go back to some of my, again, I was talking a little bit about the history of this is that uh, the uh, Michael Richard, uh, who is again one of the gurus of, of microscopic analysis, obviously, and uh, he claimed that he could he didn't need any other test. He did not need to know the dissolved oxygen or anything. He could look under the microscope of a couple of representative samples and tell you exactly what your problem was if you had a problem. So I always thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if I feel that confident, but. Ah, thanks. Thanks. That was a uh, really an interesting slideshow. It was great. Thanks. Any other questions? I was hoping there were some questions. That's why I. Uh, hey, uh, Frank, this is Zach. I've got another quick follow up uh, in yeah. screening for Nicardia. I've I've always been told that it best practice is to actually sample the foam and let it settle and then look at that under the microscope. Did you do you agree with that recommendation or do you have a. Well, yeah, you're, yeah, that, good point, Zach. Thanks for bringing that up. Not only can you examine the biomass, examining the foam microscopically is important, like Zach just brought up. You can you can identify uh, nocardia uh, very easily in the foam itself, so it gives you a good indication to, of the uh, the cause of the foam. Yes, good point. Zach, and you. uh, and just to carry on with that too, and in, uh, it's been my experience, and it's limited to mostly industrial wastewater, but. The higher life form evaluations, I typically don't get as much mileage out of that as I do flock morphologies. And sometimes if we have a, a filament, so either the lack of or an increased abundance. But do you have any other recommendations for industrial users as far as what to look at for the higher life forms? Well, you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right, Zach. The other thing is is in industrial treatment plants, we tend to operate at longer sludge ages, especially if we have membranes in play, right? And yeah. uh, one of the things, you know, when we were brought up on, on our studies of microscopy, uh, we were told how important that was to look at the relative predominance of your stalk ciliates, of your free swimmers, of your amoeboids and all that. That really doesn't help that much, uh, especially in an industrial system, especially in, in long sludge ages it's, uh, or, or those membrane systems. It's irrelevant. So, so my, uh, my recommendation is flock size, flock structure, interflock bridging. Especially if you're relying on uh, on, on uh, gravity for settling and solid separation. And you know, I've also seen some pretty significant upsets in our system. And what's struck me as odd, and it could be unique to our process, is that I've never really seen an EPS or any kind of bol a polysaccharide. We've done ND ink penetrations, and I've never seen the uh, you know an, a presence of that under you know high stress conditions. Yeah, sometimes things don't always work out like they have for a while. Sometimes there's a, we we got a situation right now where uh, we're having a, um, a, a, a problems with our membranes. Um, they're following way too fast, and it's obviously it's polysaccharides. Uh, but when we run the anthrone test. The anthrone test is saying that it shouldn't be a problem. So we're trying to examine right now where the conflict is. Membrane following in this case is not polysaccharide. Maybe it's something else that's causing it. So that's the next step of the evaluation. And a lot of times you can tell what 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 uh, what's causing a problem in your membrane based on what effectively cleans your membrane. If you can clean your membrane with a hypochlorite solution, it's probably the polysaccharide. If uh, if you can't clean it with the hypo uh, solution, then it's probably a mineral that's made its way into the uh, the fibers of the membrane that has to be cleaned out. Now we're going to have to dissolve them and move them out. But uh, yeah, it, sometimes sometimes the microscopic exam doesn't get you right where you need to be, but it gets you close. There are always exceptions. Hey Frank, this is Ian. In the past, I was told if you have a system that has high TDS that you'll likely not see as many of those higher organisms. Is that an accurate statement to your knowledge? Um, if you have high D TDS, you'll probably have a poor flock structure and that, that could be possible. Um, if it's under the effect of a toxicant, I think it's um, uh, phenol, if, if you have, now, 
bacteria can metabolize phenol. Uh, we see it in industrial systems all the time, but it takes some time for them to develop the acclimation to uh, be able to metabolize phenol. Sometimes what we see is when we see a sudden shock of phenol, we see the uh, actual stalk ciliates uh, destock themselves. Really, really weird looking under the uh, microscope. You see a, a stalk and you see a head floating off of it. And uh, so that's that's a kind of a key indicator as well. But I, I think as a general rule, I, th I think you're probably right. And if you're seeing like, uh, you know, mixed particles like that, you won't see higher life forms. Anything else? I think that's it, Matt. All right, great. Thanks, Frank. Reminder, everybody, thanks for participating. Um, and if you want to get credit for your different licenses, please go on to the Teams site, download the PDF, complete it, and send it to Patty Webster for your credit. She'll send you back a certificate. And also, um, if anybody wants to present in this format in the future, please reach out to um, myself, Frank, Ephraim, Mark, um, and I'm drawing a blank on my um, drawing a blank on the last guy on my committee here. George Rest. George, George. Yep. Reach out to George Rest, Mark Green, Ephraim. Frank or myself, uh, if you want to present and we can get you uh, through the process of getting approved to get credits for everybody. And again, if anybody's listening would like a uh, couple of free uh, trials of, of OpSize, uh, please get in touch with me or, or Brian Art, and we'll see if we can tighten you up, help a, help a client out. All right. Thank you, everybody. I will now stop recording. Excellent job. Thanks, Frank.